Friends, I welcome you to my channel. Before listening to this story, I will ask you to like and subscribe. It is not difficult for you, but it is pleasant for me. And we're starting. Yes, Mrs. Worthington, I understand. Yes, I couldn't agree more. Of course, Mrs. Worthington, I will definitely do it. Will that old chatterbox with the blue hair ever shut up? Susan Morgan asked herself in despair, listening to the chatter of the wife of the chairman of the board of the Birch Grove Mansion and Museum. But as director of development at Birch Grove, Susan knew she had no choice but to listen and agree with the older woman's rant. The young woman was not inclined to tolerate fools with joy, and she was especially outraged when someone suggested that they were smarter than her simply because of the wealth of their family. I'm fed up with rich girls who thought their money made them the authority in other people's affairs, Susan growled to herself. A glance at her watch only increased her disappointment. She was late for an important meeting. But just as Susan was about to interrupt her, the older woman abruptly interrupted her monologue. My God, look at the time. If I don't hang up now, I'm going to be late for my appointment with the hairdresser. I understand, Mrs. Worthington. Sorry to keep you so long, Susan replied without a trace of sarcasm. After her caller finally hung up, Susan quickly sent her husband an email. Dinner with a potential client. Don't wait. When the letter was sent, she hurriedly tidied up her desk, checked her makeup in a hand mirror, and then walked out the door of her small office. This room was originally the butler's pantry at Birch Grove Mansion, but at least my name is on the door, she thought. As she walked down the hallway, Evita, her Hispanic secretary, called after her. Are you leaving, Senora Morgan? Without slowing down, Susan glanced irritably over her shoulder. I'm going to visit a potential donor. I'm not coming back today. Watching what was happening, Evita saw the rhythmic swaying of the skirt from her boss's expensive suit and heard the clatter of her high heels on the marble floors of the mansion. As soon as the woman disappeared through the door, Evita rushed down the corridor to the executive director's office, stopping at his secretary's desk. Is he gone? She asked Christina. Yes. Christina replied. He left about ten minutes ago. He said he needed to attend an important meeting. Evita grinned. Everything is like clockwork. This week, last week, the week before that. Do they both need to go to meetings at the same time? Do they think we don't know what's really going on? She looked towards the exit and spat out. Putana. The two young women giggled and went back to their work. Professor Daniel Morgan looked at the many faces in his introductory economics class. Although he knew that only a few would show any sustained interest in economics, he hoped that he could at least awaken a little intellectual curiosity about the subject. To arouse this interest, an unconventional approach will be required. He clicked on an icon on his tablet computer, and a projected image of a graph filled the wall behind him. Today, he intoned, we're going to talk about the concepts of supply, demand, and price. A comedian in the lecture hall let out a low groan causing everyone to laugh. Daniel was unperturbed. I know, I know, it's boring, but these abstract concepts have an impact on the real world. Let me give you an example. He bent down and picked up the work of art, holding it so that everyone could see. Does anyone recognize this? He asked. Marilyn Monroe by Andy Warhol, a female voice said. I'm sorry, miss, I'm afraid you've got the wrong class. The art school is in another building, Daniel quipped. When the laughter died down, Daniel smiled. Seriously? Our art lover is absolutely right. So why am I showing you Andy Warhol in economics class? The answer is that this particular work, or at least one that looks almost exactly like it, was sold in 2022 for just over $195 million. This makes her the current record holder for the sales of an American artist. The students whistled a couple of times. I suppose, Daniel continued, that no one in this class was a customer. This caused a few chuckles. There are no billionaires here? Well, I was hoping. Anyway, the fact is, at that price, Andy had only one buyer for Marilyn. However, any of us could go to the university bookstore right now and buy a reproduction of Marilyn for about $1.20. And why are there so many buyers in the bookstore and so few at the auction? It's all about the price. At a price of $195 million, there was only one buyer. But at a price of $1.20, demand is skyrocketing. Before you start objecting, I know that there are many factors that affect the market demand for any product, product or service. We will look at them in the next lessons. But the fact remains that price is one of the, if not the most important, factors determining demand. When the lecture ended, Daniel was glad that several students came over to ask questions or argue a different point of view. 
At least I got them thinking about the subject, he thought with satisfaction. Back in his office, he hid the picture of Monroe behind a filing cabinet and then took his cell phone out of his pocket. He felt it vibrate during the lecture, but made it a rule never to interrupt classes to check. Now he saw that Susan would not be home again tonight. It bothered him that it seemed to happen so often, but at least it gave him the opportunity to come in and check on his father. When Ezra was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease a few years ago, the older man insisted that he was doing fine in his own home. But Daniel saw that his father's symptoms were getting worse, and his anxiety prompted him to visit him more often. When he got through to his father on the phone, the elderly man launched into a rambling speech about real and imaginary symptoms, doctors who don't know what they're doing, and the problems of the world in general. When Daniel finally managed to ask if it would be convenient for him to come in, his father insisted that he come and stay for dinner. Daniel tried to protest, but his father interrupted him. Here, he said, talk to Paloma, and handed over the phone. Paloma was Ezra Morgan's nurse and guardian. When his father's condition deteriorated noticeably, Daniel insisted that he be constantly looked after if he wanted to stay at home. The old man sullenly agreed and immediately began to scold every guardian the agency sent with their complaints, insults, and hostile behavior. Just when Daniel decided he would have no choice but to put his father in a nursing home, Paloma arrived. The young woman had two significant advantages over her predecessors. First of all, she was unexpectedly pretty, which Ezra definitely appreciated. Secondly, Paloma was not at all embarrassed by Ezra's bragging. When he snapped at her, she snapped back. When he refused to follow the doctor's orders, she pestered him until he gave up and obeyed. And when he was grumpy and harsh, she ignored him until he stopped trying to piss her off. One day, when Daniel came in to see how things were going with the new nurse, his father surprised him by saying that he approved of Paloma. She doesn't take shit from me, he said, and Daniel dared to hope that they had finally found a solution. Those hopes were dealt a serious blow about ten months later when Paloma called Daniel to tell him she was going to quit. This is my son Marco, she told him. My mother took care of him, but now my grandmother is ill and my mother has to live with her. Besides, Marco is ready to go to school, and there's just no way I can take care of him and Senor Morgan at the same time. If Daniel was upset by this news, Ezra simply refused to accept it. To Daniel's amazement, the old man came up with a solution. Come and live here in my house, he told her. This place is big enough. In addition, you will save on rent and on trips to work. I'll even buy groceries. What about Marco? You don't want a six-year-old running around your house. You know, I used to have a six-year-old boy here. Besides, Marco will let me talk to him when I get tired of your nagging. She went to Daniel's office to talk to him about the offer. As soon as he recovered from his surprise, he began to see the benefits. In addition to the continuous care from the person his father liked, Daniel thought that living in a family environment could benefit his father. It's up to you, Paloma, Daniel told her. I think it could be a good decision for Dad, and I know I would feel better if he was taken care of by someone he likes. But you have to decide if it's going to be good for you and Marco. I believe it could work, Senor Daniel, but it would be better if you tried to come more often, you know, for your father's sake. And Marco would like that, too. Then, to his surprise, she blushed deeply before turning and running out the door. Her reaction confused him, but he was glad when he heard that she had accepted his father's offer. Now, after 18 months of a new arrangement, Daniel was not at all surprised to hear that his father was listening to Paloma's wishes and was not displeased when she also persuaded him to stay for dinner. Considering that the alternative was to eat takeout alone at home on campus, Daniel didn't put up much resistance. In addition to her nursing skills, Paloma turned out to be an excellent cook. It would be nice to have some homemade food for a change, he thought, and his mood improved. Susan hated the long drive through the countryside, but she knew it was necessary. Neither she nor Grant could afford to be recognized when they were developing perspectives together. It was not only the length of the road that bothered her, but also the fact that she passed all the small dilapidated houses along the way. I used to live in a dump like this, she thought, and the memories came back to her. Her father abandoned the family when she and her sister were in elementary school. Her mother and two daughters were forced to move into a rented shack that her mother could barely afford on a maid's salary. The girls' classmates at school fared little better, but that didn't stop them from mercilessly molesting the two sisters. But Susan was smart. In high school, she had good grades, high enough to receive a full scholarship to the University of Pennsylvania. 
education, she was taught, was a way out of poverty, a way to achieve the same lifestyle that all the other students seemed to enjoy. And although these girls were not unkind, it was impossible not to take into account socioeconomic differences. While her classmates danced on weekends at fraternity and sorority parties, Susan was in her dorm and preparing for tests on Monday. While they were spending the summer in Europe, she worked part-time on campus. However, in her senior year, Susan took a break when she attracted the attention of a handsome economics teaching assistant. Daniel Morgan was on his way to a PhD, but he wasn't a nerd. He had a good sense of humor and loved socializing. When he met her, he found Susan's combination of intelligence and beauty irresistible. There were rules prohibiting relationships between teachers and undergraduates, but since he studied economics and she studied fine arts, the rules were easy to ignore. Susan has already dated a few men and tried several sexual encounters, but she was determined to get better, and she knew that being a college slut wasn't the way to succeed. Now, faced with the prospect of a relationship with a man with a future, she did everything she could to grab onto it. He never had a chance. A man with a future? Ha! Huh, she thought angrily. She expected Daniel to join one of the large investment banks or management consulting firms that regularly recruited staff on campus. When he told her that he dreamed of an academic career, she was quietly disappointed. But maybe in the end he will head a large educational institution, she consoled herself. A little research on the internet convinced her that several university rectors have an economics degree. But now, seven years after they got married, she discovered that she lives on campus and her husband enjoys teaching at the university. This is not the future I wanted, she swore. In this spoiled environment, she got a job raising funds for a local museum in a converted mansion formerly owned by one of Pennsylvania's oil barons. She was once again in debt to a bunch of rich matrons and their simpering offspring, listening to their gossip, obeying their imperious demands. But it won't be for long, she vowed to herself as she steered the car behind the small rural motel where she and Grant had met. I found a new climbing path. No sooner had Daniel got out of the car at his father's house than the front door flew open and a small ball of boyish energy flew towards him. Senor Daniel, Senor Daniel, will you play football with me? Marco shouted. Marco, Paloma shouted, stepping out onto the porch. Leave Senor Daniel alone. He had been teaching all day and was tired. Before the little boy's face could stretch, Daniel waved his mother away. It's all right, Paloma, come on, Marco, show me your skills. With that, the two of them began to play, dribbling, passing, and hitting a grass, stained soccer ball. While they were running around the yard, Daniel noticed that Paloma went inside and took his father out to look at them. The old man was delighted with what was happening, excitedly cheering them on, although he had never been to a football match in his life. They finally stopped when Paloma invited them to dinner. Marco protested, but Daniel was just as happy to leave. I'm not in shape to keep up with this boy, especially playing football. Expecting traditional Latin American cuisine, Daniel was pleasantly surprised when Paloma served a Mediterranean-style dish. Chicken kebab with basmati rice, Greek salad, and lavash on the side. Ezra grumbled that he wanted a hamburger, but Daniel noticed that he had eaten all of his plate. They had dinner with the whole family, discussing the past day, their plans for the week, and other little things that made Daniel's mood even better. He realized that he hadn't thought about Susan since he arrived. As they cleared away the plates, Paloma leaned over and whispered, In case you're wondering, I try to stick to the Mediterranean diet with Senor Morgan whenever he lets me. I want to protect his heart as much as possible. Thank you, Paloma. Whatever you're doing, it seems to be working. I haven't seen Dad so energetic in a long time. After the dishes were in the dishwasher, they all moved into the living room. After talking a little more, Daniel noticed that Marco was quiet. I think even seven-year-olds can get tired after such an intense game, he thought in surprise. Paloma noticed it too and took Marco to his room. By the time she oversaw her son's bedtime preparations, he was already half asleep but as soon as he lay down, his eyes opened again. Mom, can Senor Daniel come in and say goodnight to me? We don't want to impose on him, she said sternly before relenting. But I'll ask. Daniel liked the boy's request, and he readily followed Paloma back to Marco's bed. To his surprise, the boy reached out and hugged him, then lay down again, rolled over and closed his eyes. Good night, Marco, Daniel said softly, tucking the blanket around the boy's shoulder. Good night. When they returned to the study, Daniel saw that his father had also dozed off. 
He helped Paloma carry him back to the bedroom and put him to bed. Daniel was surprised to realize how little his father weighed. After the two of them returned to the office, Daniel thanked Paloma for dinner and told her that he would go home. Won't you stay a little longer? I, could you tell me a little bit about the painting in the living room? She asked, reaching for his hand before stopping herself. Of course, he said, and followed her into another room. There was an Andy Warhol painting, Marilyn Monroe in blue, in a special frame on the wall. Shatterproof glass protected the frame, which was firmly bolted to the wall. There were special pads at the four corners of the frame, sensitive to any change in pressure between the wall and the work of art. On the opposite wall, two small devices were emitting infrared rays, looking for anything that came too close to work. I'm sure my dad warned you about all the security measures, Daniel said, and Paloma nodded. That's why I'm not letting Marco in here, she explained. One day he hit a soccer ball against the wall, and in the blink of an eye the security service arrived here to investigate. She shook her head. We will not repeat this mistake again. But what I do not know is how your father got such a special painting. It's a good story. My grandfather was a printer in Germany before the Second World War. He ran away just before things got bad and came to America, leaving only his name. In fact, he had lost some of that, too. Some immigration officer on Ellis Island had replaced Morgenstern with Morgan. Anyway, my grandfather found a job as a printer in New York and brought his son, my father, into the business so that he could learn this craft. My father became interested in silkscreen printing, which was just beginning to gain popularity for artwork in the early 1960s. In short, he ended up working as an apprentice at a company that printed many of Andy Warhol's silkscreens. Apparently, Warhol once noticed that my father was working late and took a liking to him. On impulse, he gave him this painting on the wall and even signed the dedication on the back. It's a real gift to someone Warhol barely knew. I agree, but you must remember that at that time Warhol was selling his silk screens for only a few hundred dollars. He probably felt that the artist's evidence was simply not that valuable. In any case, it was only later that the cost of Warhol's work began to skyrocket. But isn't it dangerous to keep it here? Not many people know that my father has a Warhol painting, and it has never been evaluated. But when this auction recently received such wide publicity, we couldn't ignore the risk. That's when my father took all the security measures. I won't say they're reliable, but as you and Marco have learned, even touching a wall will trigger a quick security response. She looked at the painting again. I can understand why your father wants to keep her here. He must be very proud of it. That's right, Daniel nodded, and I'm very proud of him. Paloma smiled and nodded. A little later, Daniel got into his car to return to the old Victorian-style house that the university had provided on campus. As he drove away, he looked back at the light coming through the windows of his father's house. I wish my house was as bright. He sighed. Susan was often away these days, and even when she was at home, the atmosphere seemed cool. He shook his head and drove away. When Susan left the motel, she still felt the delicious sensations of post-coital bliss between her thighs. Nothing helps a girl relax like a good intimacy, she thought with satisfaction. And Grant Nicholson was a good partner in bed, in no small part because he was truly in love with her. His ardor was practically oozing out of his pores, and when they were in bed, he was desperate to bring her to orgasm after orgasm. But as she was leaving their squalid love nest, her thoughts turned to her husband. It's not that Daniel is a bad husband, and he's certainly not a bad lover, but he just doesn't have the drive and ambition she needs. Grant likes talking to all these millionaires on the board of directors, and he's good at it. Daniel likes to go to university parties and socialize with other teachers. Every time she has to attend one of these events, she just wants to scream. She gripped the steering wheel tighter. But as soon as his old man dies and Daniel gets his inheritance, I'll divorce him in the blink of an eye. And once I get my half of the income from Warhol and the house, I'll have as much money as these rich bitches, not to mention a husband with a high reputation. As she drove up to their house, her face twisted into a grin. Accommodation at the university? Well, I can take this dump a little longer, and so can my husband. The next time Daniel saw Paloma, she wasn't smiling. He had just finished taking the exam when he heard a knock on his office door. Looking up, he was startled to see a young woman standing there, and her expression filled him with alarm. What's wrong, Paloma? Did something happen to my dad? Is Marco all right? She hurried in, closing the door behind her, and sat down on one of his side chairs. Your dad's fine, Daniel, 
My mother will stay with him and Marco while I'm here. But he shook his head impatiently. So what happened? What's happening? You know that I have a big family in this area, right? I didn't know, but go on. One of my sisters, Christina, works at Birch Grove. She is the secretary of Mr. Nicholson, the executive director. Anyway, Christina sees Mrs. Morgan at the mansion every day. Yes, but... Daniel, I'm sorry, but your wife and Mr. Nicholson are having an affair. Her words hit him hard. His first impulse was to deny the possibility because he didn't want to believe it. But given the current state of his relationship with his wife, he immediately understood how Roman could explain what was happening. Pulling himself together, he leaned forward in his chair. How does your sister know that? What is it? he asked tensely. Paloma looked unhappy. We have a cousin who works as a maid at the Pocono View Motel. It's north of here, about 30 kilometers down the highway. He waved his hand impatiently, and she hurried on. Your wife and Mr. Nicholson meet there almost every week. The last time was two days ago, the night you had dinner with Senor Morgan, Marco, and me. He gritted his teeth, remembering that night and how late Susan had gone to bed, but he spoke quietly and with restraint. Paloma, this is very serious. I can't just take the word of a person I've never met, even if she's your cousin. I know, I know, but you don't have to take her word for it. Is it possible to... Could you come there with me right now? Half an hour later, at the motel, Paloma introduced Daniel to her cousin Lourdes, whose command of English was rudimentary. But since Paloma was helping with the translation, the maid took the couple to a utility room in the main hallway of the motel. She opened the grate into the ventilation system and pulled out the recording device that was hidden there. Daniel looked at Lourdes, then at Paloma. How did this get here? He growled. Our family was together, and Christina shared with us her suspicions about Signor Nicholson and his frequent meetings with Signora Morgan. When she showed us the photo, Lourdes recognized them as a couple who regularly visit the motel. She looked at Daniel pleadingly. I'm sorry, Daniel, but I knew I had to find out the truth. I gave Lourdes the recorder. I hope you don't hate me for this. Daniel ignored her implied question. Instead, he pointed at the device. Have you been listening to this? He demanded an answer. She lowered her head. Yes, partially. Lords turned it on for me when she called. That's when I realized I had to tell you. Okay, Daniel said grimly. Tell her to turn on the recording. When Lords pressed the arrow button, all three of them jumped at the volume. My God, Grant, there, there, there. Yes, yes, don't stop, don't stop, ah. It came out of a small speaker. Lords quickly stopped the playback and then turned to Paloma. Do you want her to go back to the beginning? Paloma asked Daniel. Daniel shook his head, his face pale. I'm not, no, I recognize Susan's voice. He rubbed his temples. I really don't want to hear the whole damn story. Let's just get on with it from here. The cousin fiddled with the volume control and then pressed play. At first, they only heard the rustle of the sheets and the groan of the bed springs. A moment later, the lover's conversation resumed. God, Susan, you're amazing. I just can't get enough of you, Grant Nicholson's admiring voice rang out. Then his tone became almost insistent. Honestly, baby, I don't want to wait any longer. Just say the word and I'll divorce my wife tomorrow. All I want is to be with you. No! Susan's voice rang out sharply. Don't you understand, Grant? There's nothing we can do until Daniel's old man dies. As soon as he dies and Daniel inherits Warhol, I can divorce him. He'll have to auction it off as part of the agreement, and I'll get my half of the proceeds. After that, you can say goodbye to Greta and we'll finally be together. Are you sure you can get half of Warhol? I thought the inheritance was protected. The smirk on her face was obvious from the sound of Susan's voice. Don't worry about it. I have a lawyer who knows how to get around this. And since he gets paid, depending on the amount of compensation, I can guarantee you that he is highly motivated. Yes, but how much longer do we have to wait? Nicholson whimpered. Be patient, baby, Susan reassured him. The old man is going downhill fast. We'll get what we want soon enough. Daniel reached out and angrily jabbed his finger at the off button. What a treacherous woman. She had calculated everything. He banged his fist on the counter, startling the two women. Then he turned around and walked out of the motel. Paloma gave Lords a quick hug, then grabbed the recorder and hurried to the parking lot. She found Daniel standing by his car, staring into space. He turned to her as she approached, and his eyes reflected the anger and despair of a man who had been betrayed. I tried so hard, Paloma. I knew she was unhappy with our marriage, but I kept trying to fix it. His expression darkened. 
Now I know why nothing worked. Now his voice was full of determination. Get in the car. We need to get back to the city. She got into the passenger seat, and as soon as they were on the road, she said timidly, I hope you're not mad at me, Daniel. I felt that you would want to know what she was doing. He shook his head from side to side. I'm not mad at you, Paloma, but I'm really mad at Susan. What are you going to do? You're not going to hurt her, are you? He looked at her. Yes, I'm going to hurt her. And Nicholson, too. Seeing her expression, he added, But not in the way you imagine. I'm not a violent person, but I guarantee you that they won't like what's going to happen. She reached out to take his hand. I don't want you to get in trouble, Daniel. I just couldn't. He gave her a small smile. Don't worry, Paloma, everything will be fine. Then his smile disappeared. While you're dealing with your mother and Marco, I need to talk to my dad. He shook his head sadly. He was so excited when I married Susan. She made a big impression on him. He couldn't wait for us to have children. When he hears what I've learned, he'll be as upset as I am. He looked at Paloma with an ironic expression on his face. It's ironic, you know. I was so upset every time Susan said she wasn't ready to start a family. But now I'm really glad we didn't do that. They rode the rest of the way in silence, each lost in his own thoughts. The conversation with his father was long and painful. But in the end, the two men worked out a plan of action. Daniel's first step was to file for divorce to thwart Susan's plan. His father promised to ask his own lawyer to recommend a divorce lawyer. He also warned his son not to say or do anything that might suggest to Susan what he had learned. I can do it, Dad, Daniel agreed. I'll just avoid her as much as possible until I'm ready to serve her. Considering how little time we already spend with each other, it shouldn't be too difficult. To hide his feelings, Daniel spent most of the weekend on campus checking test papers, updating lesson plans, and generally trying to ensure that his academic life was not too disrupted by the impending divorce. When his father called him on Monday with a recommendation, Daniel immediately contacted the lawyer's office to arrange an appointment, but he was disappointed to learn that he would not be able to meet the woman until Thursday. He thought about looking for another lawyer on the internet, but then changed his mind. If Susan is going to try to pull off some kind of legal shenanigans, I need someone really good on my side. I can take it a little longer. When Thursday finally came, Daniel was glad he had been patient. His new lawyer seemed competent and confident. I think I know what your wife is planning, but I really don't think you should worry about your father's painting, the woman assured him. Until we submit the application as soon as possible, Warhol will in no way become part of any property agreement. She promised that she would prepare his lawsuit for filing next week and could prepare a court order for service later that day. Almost done, Daniel thought as he headed back to his office on campus. And if we're lucky... We'll take care of Mr. Grant Nicholson, too. For the first time since he found out about Susan's betrayal, he felt a little relaxed. The call he received on Sunday shattered his complacency. When he answered, at first he heard nothing but the woman's sobs. I'm so sorry, Daniel. I tried so hard to help him. I really tried. An icy horror gripped his heart. Who can I help, Paloma? What happened? This is Senor Morgan, she shouted, then fell silent. I have to go. The paramedics have arrived. The connection was interrupted. Jumping to his feet, Daniel ran to his car and rushed to his father's house. He found that the street was blocked by a car, an ambulance, and another truck. Parking further down the street, he ran to the house, arriving just in time to see paramedics rolling a gurney onto the porch. Is he all right? What is it? He asked desperately. The doctor looked at him. Are you a son? Yes, yes, it's me. Is he alive? The man slowly shook his head. Sorry, we couldn't do anything. When we arrived here, he was gone. His heart stopped beating. It looks like he had a massive stroke or an aneurysm. But what about defibrillation? Could it help? The man looked at him sympathetically. I'm sorry, sir, but even if we could restart his heart, nothing else would work, do you understand? You wouldn't want that, and neither would he. When the gurney was loaded into the ambulance and slowly taken away, Daniel could only stand in shock. Finally, he forced himself to trudge into the house. When Paloma saw him, she ran up to him and, sobbing, threw herself into his arms. I'm sorry, Daniel. I tried so hard to get him back. I did chest compressions until the medics arrived, but it wasn't enough. I'm so sorry. Through his own tears, he pulled her away from him to look at her face. It's not your fault, Paloma. You did everything you could. 
I was talking to the ER doctor outside. He told me that dad must have had a stroke or a brain aneurysm. He probably died before you even got to him. She rested her head on Daniel's chest and continued to sob. He was sitting at the table and chatting with me. Suddenly, he grabbed his head and told me he was in pain. Then he just rolled over and fell to the floor. Oh, Daniel, it was terrible. He carefully led the distraught woman to a chair so she could sit down, then went to get water for both of them. When he returned, he asked, Where's Marco? Marco? Madre de Dios. I almost forgot. He's at school. I have to go and get him. She started crying again. Marco will be so upset. He really loved your father. She hurried away, leaving Daniel alone in the suddenly empty house. He sat there for a long time. Grief clouded his attempts to understand how his life had suddenly changed. He knew his father was dying, but he wasn't ready to lose him so soon. His own tears flowed again, and there was no one to comfort him. Finally, he pulled himself together enough to make a list of the people he needed to notify and the tasks he needed to complete. As soon as he wrote down everything that came to his mind, he began the sad business of making phone calls. After he got through or left messages for the most urgent group, Daniel locked up his father's house and drove to Birch Grove to complete the task he had left for last. As much as he hated the idea, he decided to break the news to Susan personally. I want to see how she reacts, he thought bitterly. She was amazed to see him enter her small office, and when she heard the news, she said all the right things and showed proper grief. But watching her, he had to bite his tongue to keep from venting his anger. These are crocodile tears, he raged to himself. She must be absolutely delighted because now she can start implementing her plan. But he managed to keep himself in control until he left. As soon as he left, Susan ran out of her office, almost skipping down the hall to tell Grant Nicholson the news. Grant was startled by Susan's sudden appearance and taken aback by the news she blurted out. Automatically, he started to express his condolences, but she interrupted him. Can't you see that this is good news? This is what we've been waiting for. Now that the old man is gone, his property goes to Daniel. I can file for divorce, settle property issues, and as soon as it's final, you and I can be together. Grant felt his own excitement match hers. I can't believe the wait is over. So, when are you planning to file for divorce? She thought for a moment. I don't want to sound heartless. I'll wait until his father is buried and the memorial service is over before I apply. It makes sense, Grant admitted, but don't wait too long. Remember, it's probably going to take me a while to sort things out with Greta. The next few days for Daniel were filled with all the sorrowful responsibilities that death entails. His first and most urgent duty was to bury his father. Despite the fact that his father was not observant, he left instructions that he wanted to be buried in accordance with Jewish tradition. This meant arranging the burial the next day. As soon as the arrangements for his father's burial were made, Daniel began organizing a memorial service for friends and neighbors who were unable to attend the funeral. He had no other living relatives, but Ezra had made many friends during his career, and now they had come to pay their last respects. Similarly, Daniel's friends and colleagues came to express their condolences and support. The fact that so many people were present gave him some comfort. Both the funeral and the memorial service were difficult for Daniel, not only because of the grief he was experiencing, but also because he was forced to attend both with Susan. As before, she played the grieving wife perfectly, but Daniel knew what her true thoughts were, and his anger turned into burning hatred. During all this, Daniel's new lawyer called to ask for instructions on how to arrange Daniel's divorce. Given the many responsibilities he faced, Daniel asked her to postpone his divorce. I'll have to call you back, he told her. My life is pretty crazy right now. After the memorial service was over, a new and unexpected complication arose. Back at his father's house, Paloma asked him when he wanted Marco and her to move out. Daniel was stunned. You can't leave, Paloma. First of all, you have nowhere to go, and I'm not going to kick you out on the street. If anything, if the house is empty, it will become a target for thieves or vandals. Besides, if you go somewhere else, it will most likely mean transferring Marco to a new school. He's doing well where he is. I don't want to risk ruining everything. You should stay at least for a while. She gratefully agreed, fully aware that Daniel's kindness and care were a more important factor than the reasons he gave. When his father was buried and all services were completed, Daniel then contacted his father's lawyer to find out what needed to be done in connection with the management of his father's estate. 
The list of steps he had to take in connection with the probate process was long. When she and Daniel finished looking through them, the lawyer added an unexpected duty. Ezra, the lawyer informed Daniel, has requested that the reading of his will take place as soon as possible, even before it is submitted for approval. Moreover, his father left a list of people to invite. After hearing the list, Daniel understood everything. I have one request, he told the family lawyer. In order to make the reading of the will as formal as possible, can we hold it at your law office? If it takes place there and your office sends out invitations, I think it's more likely that everyone who should be there will come. The old man readily agreed. On the appointed day of the reading of the will, Daniel and Susan arrived at the lawyer's office separately. Taking their seats at the small conference table in the law library, they greeted each other with strained cordiality. With the exception of services for his father, the two of them spent very little time together. Now, despite her outward calm, Daniel could tell that his wife was almost seething with excitement. He, on the other hand, was calm and collected. A few minutes later, Paloma came in and introduced herself to the lawyer. Susan stared at her, then leaned over to Daniel and asked angrily, What is she doing here? He stared at her without emotion. She was invited. Before Susan could answer, she was startled to see Grant Nicholson enter. Were you invited too? What is it? She asked. He nodded. I'm not sure why, but the invitation was quite clear. Just at that moment, the lawyer stood up and defiantly cleared his throat. May I have your attention, please? It looks like everyone who is invited is present. The late Mr. Morgan clearly wished that each of you would be present here at the announcement of his last will and testament, he said in a resonant voice. I will not test your patience by fully familiarizing myself with all the legal details of his will. Instead, Mr. Morgan wanted me to, as he put it, get down to business. He cleared his throat. Firstly, the late Mr. Morgan appointed Daniel Morgan, his only child, as executor of his will. Daniel's responsibility will be to ensure that any taxes due are paid and any outstanding debts or other obligations are settled. Once these issues are properly resolved, he will oversee the disposition of the estate's assets in accordance with the conditions and wishes of his father. Daniel has agreed to act in this capacity and, as I am informed, has already begun the process of settling the estate's debts, paying taxes and other obligations. Susan shot a quick glance at Grant, giving him a fleeting smile of anticipation. This brings us to asset allocation, the lawyer continued. The first will concerns Mr. Morgan's house, where he lived for the last 20, seven years of his life as well as the land on which it is located. His will says, I hereby leave my home and lands to Paloma Contreras in gratitude for the long service she rendered me during my illness and need. I'm also leaving all the funds remaining in my checking account to help her pay the bills. What? Susan cried out in surprise. How can he give his house to this one? This maid, Daniel should have it. Yes, you're right, Paloma interjected, recovering from her surprise. It should go to Daniel, not me. She looked at Daniel for support, but he didn't return her gaze. Anyway, the lawyer continued, the late Mr. Morgan made his wishes very clear. And now, may I move on to the second point of the will? When the group calmed down, the lawyer continued, the second item in the will concerns an Andy Warhol painting hanging in my living room. I hereby bequeath Warhol's painting to the Birch Grove Mansion and Museum to become part of his permanent collection. Oh my God, Nicholson gasped. No, it's all wrong, Susan screamed. He can't do that. He should have left Warhol to Daniel. I'm sorry, Mrs. Morgan, but Mr. Morgan has unequivocally bequeathed a Warhol painting to Birch Grove, the lawyer intoned. He wants it to be hung in a prominent place in the museum. But that means Daniel won't get anything, Susan screamed. Did his father cut him out of his will? How could he do that? This is wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, the lawyer said loudly, if I may get your attention, I haven't finished reading the terms of the will. Please keep in mind that the second clause of the will made by Mr. Morgan is conditional. The will goes on to say, my gift of Birch Grove depends on the fulfillment of two requirements. First, Birch Grove must immediately and permanently sever any professional relationship with Mrs. Susan Morgan. Secondly, Mr. Grant Nicholson, the executive director of Birch Grove, must immediately and permanently end the relationship he maintained with Mrs. Susan Morgan. In the event that any of these two requirements are not fully met, the ownership of Warhol will pass to the Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh, he pointed at Grant Nicholson. In case you're wondering, sir, I sent a notice of this condition of the will to Pittsburgh just before this meeting. 
As far as I understand, the Warhol Museum will closely monitor your compliance with these requirements. This is ridiculous, Susan screamed. This annoying old man has no right to interfere in our personal lives. She turned to Daniel. This is all you're doing, isn't it? You're trying to cheat me out of what's legally mine. I would never do that, Susan. In fact, I have here what legally belongs to you. With that, he handed her the envelope he had brought with him to the meeting. She tore it open and stared at the contents as if they were written in Greek. What is it? What is it? She asked. This is your official notice that I have filed for divorce, he said. Then taking out your iPhone and taking a picture to document your actions, he said grimly, Susan Morgan, you've been charged now. You bastard, you can't divorce me. I'm divorcing you. Stop it, she screamed. Daniel just smiled. While she was screaming, Susan didn't notice that Grant had quietly slipped out of the room. When she finally realized he was gone, she hurried after him. Meanwhile, Paloma was trying to argue with Daniel. This is wrong, Daniel. Senor Morgan should have left his house to you, not to me. You're his son. It's wrong that you don't have anything. Daniel smiled now. Paloma, it's okay. Dad and I discussed it. He loved you and Marco and wanted to make sure you were taken care of when he was gone. He knew that I understood everything and that I wanted it too. He took her by the shoulders and looked at her carefully. Don't you see? He was a gruff, old-fashioned man who found it difficult to express his feelings. He didn't know how to tell you how much he appreciated the care you showed, the companionship you provided, and the fact that you didn't take any shit out on him. It was his way of expressing his love. She wiped away more tears. Marco and I, we loved him too, Daniel. Susan literally ran down the hallway at Birch Grove to Grant's office. Ignoring his secretary, she stormed into her boss's office. Grant, Grant, she gasped. This is wonderful news. With the addition of Warhol's paintings to the collection, the Birch Grove will attract many new visitors. You will become the head of the most prestigious art museum in the area. Thank you, Susan, he replied carefully. I think you're right. And after everything settles down, she continued, our relationship will no longer have to remain a secret, as you always wanted. His face narrowed. Didn't you hear the clause the old man added to his will? What is it? He asked sharply. There's no way this can be legally binding, she retorted. It'll be a source of gossip at the country club, but it'll pass quickly. Except for the Warhol Museum, he said. They would be happy to add such an important item to their collection, so they will be watching us very closely. The tremor in her voice betrayed her fear. But as I said, it can't be legal. No court will comply with such a requirement. Now Grant was angry. Do you really expect Birch Grove to sue the Warhol Museum? Do you know what resources they have? They have money from the Carnegie Endowment behind them. If they sue, the legal fees could bankrupt us. He stood up and handed his ex-lover a sheaf of papers. I'm sorry, Susan, but I've already talked to Mr. Worthington about this. As of today, you are no longer an employee of Birch Grove. Grant, you can't do this, not after all we've meant to each other. Then her tone became shriller. Besides, you don't want me to tell your wife about us. I've already confessed to her, he told Susan coldly. And as soon as I'm done here, I'm going home to continue groveling. I hope the prestige of the wife of the executive director of the Birch Grove will calm her offended feelings. And now it's time for you to leave the mansion. We will arrange for the severance package to be mailed to you. She stood and glared at him, her fists clenched at her sides. Instinctively, he took half a step back, fearing that she might attack him. Instead, she turned on her heel and strode away, heading down the hallway to her former office. She quickly grabbed a few personal items and left. Passing by her secretary's desk, Evita asked, Are you leaving, Mrs. Morgan? Yes. Susan replied without even looking at her. As her heels clicked on the marble, Evita called after her. Goodbye, sweetheart. She then hurried over to Christina's desk to tell her what had just happened. Daniel was rummaging through the fridge in search of dinner when he heard the keys ringing in the front door. When he entered the living room, he saw Susan enter with a sullen expression on her face. When she saw her future ex-husband, her expression changed to anger. This is all you're doing, isn't it? How long have you known about Grant and me? Long enough to ruin your little scheme, he retorted. So you made Ezra change his will, she said bitterly. He was going to leave everything to you, and you talked him into changing it. Why would you do that? Because I wanted to be damn sure you'd never get to that no matter what happened. 
When I heard that you and your lawyer had some kind of plan to declare Warhol public property by donating him to Birch Grove Insurance Company, that couldn't happen. Plus, it gave me leverage to ruin your little romance with Grant. I thought his love would disappear pretty quickly if I had to choose between you or Warhol. So you really hate me that much? He looked at her incredulously. After what you tried to do. You're damn right, he shouted. She stared at him, shocked that he was so angry. After a moment, he regained his composure. There's one thing I want to know. Have you ever loved me? She sighed and flopped into a chair. I think I used to love when we were first married. You were so dynamic, so full of potential. I thought you'd climb the corporate ladder and take me with you. She shook her head and a bitter expression twisted her lips. Imagine my disappointment when I saw which path you chose instead. Soon after, I started looking for a better opportunity. So money and prestige have always been important to you. Was love and a good life not enough? How like Norman Rockwell you are, she grinned. Don't you know, this is what losers choose when they don't have what it takes to win. Family, friends, community. Is this your idea of losing? What I want is respect, the kind that money and position in society give. That's what's important. The rest is just for show. He started arguing, then decided it wasn't worth it. So what's going to happen next? Her bravado evaporated. I'm leaving. Thanks to you, my reputation in this city is shit. As soon as I get everything I need, I'll leave. And don't worry, assuming we split the property equally. I won't fight the divorce. All I want is half of our savings and half of the proceeds from the sale of the house. I'm sorry, Susan. You're forgetting that this house doesn't belong to us. It belongs to the university. She gritted her teeth. You've always been so smart. Why couldn't you be more ambitious? Without waiting for an answer, she headed for the bedroom. After a while, she appeared with a suitcase, a bag for clothes, and a set of cosmetics. I'm leaving now, she told him. I'll ask my lawyer to contact yours and we'll arrange a divorce as soon as possible. She gave him a dark look. At least we agree on one thing. We both want to end this marriage. He looked at her curiously. So where are you going? As far away from here as possible. Somewhere where I can start over. Hopefully with someone a little more aggressive. Daniel watched her go. Good riddance, he thought with satisfaction. This time Susan kept her word and their divorce went smoothly. Daniel hated paying child support, but he could hardly argue with the fact that his future ex-wife was now unemployed. It's a small price to pay to get rid of her, and even less if you consider what she tried to do to you, his lawyer advised him. Meanwhile, Daniel was busy working as an executor of his father's estate. Every day it seemed that another demand appeared, to hand out copies of the death certificate, to stop paying social security to his father, to notify the tax service to send legal notices to creditors, and much more. After classes, Daniel regularly found himself at his father's house, sorting out the property he had hidden for many years, paying bills and settling his father's financial affairs. To his horror, he discovered that his father had paid for everything with paper checks. Until he was able to transfer the bills to electronic payment, Daniel found himself writing more checks in a few weeks than in a few years. Although this task took a lot of time, it gave Daniel the opportunity to work in the company of Paloma and Marco. His house on campus seemed dark and gloomy, and his father's house seemed filled with light and life. It was not unusual for him to work late into the evening and have dinner with them. He felt guilty about being intrusive, but Paloma begged him to stay. Even after he was almost done settling his father's affairs, she begged him to continue dining with them. It's hard to cook just for the two of us, she insisted and he was glad to give in to her request. He found that being part of a family was a good cure for the grief caused by the loss of his father and the bitterness of the breakdown of his marriage. A few weeks later, Daniel got a call from his father's lawyer. The probate court has signed the final report on the condition of your father's estate. Now you are free to dispose of his assets as he ordered. Really? I thought making a will usually takes months. The old man chuckled. Normally you'd be right, but your father's will seems to have been put at the top of the list. Of course, this may have something to do with the number of influential people on the board of directors of Birchgrove. It looks like they can't wait to get their hands on their new prize. Anyway, now you can move on. An hour after Daniel received the message from the lawyer, Grant Nicholson called him and asked when Birchgrove could expect to take possession of the Warhol painting. As I think you know, 
the museum and I have fully complied with the terms of your father's will. And now that this has been confirmed by the will, we are obviously eager to proceed with the transfer. Although the legal obstacles have been removed, a new complication has arisen. The curator of the museum insisted that her own people pack and transport the silkscreen to the birch grove, but the transfer had to be coordinated with the security company, which had to carefully disable all protective devices and systems. The safe completion and decommissioning of various systems was a difficult task. It would take two groups more than a day to make the transfer. Waiting for the progress reports in his office, Nicholson felt like a child on Christmas Eve. By tomorrow morning, the most valuable piece of art Birch Grove has ever owned will be at their disposal. To celebrate, the museum held a private screening for the board of directors and special guests the following evening. The awkwardness of his affair with Susan was reflected in the rearview mirror. The future of the museum and its executive director looked really bright ahead. After arranging with a security company to protect his father's house during the transfer of the Warhol painting, Daniel took Paloma and Marco on a day trip to the Poconos. The three of them went hiking along the scenic trail, had lunch at Flagstaff Lodge, and took a ride along the Lehigh Gorge Scenic Railroad. By the time they got home, everyone except the security guard from the security company had left. The living room was cleaned and the furniture was put in place. Nevertheless, Marilyn Monroe's smiling face was not in the picture, and all three felt his absence. Trying to dispel the gloomy mood, Daniel brainstormed, It's too late to cook dinner. How about ordering a pizza? The offer was well received, and soon the three of them shared several large pizzas. By the time they finished, the combination of a hearty meal and the day's worries had exhausted them all. Marco was already asleep, and Daniel carried him to bed. Then, as he headed for the front door, Paloma stopped him. Please, Daniel, stay here tonight. Without all the security systems, I will feel safer. You can sleep in your father's room. He tried to object, but she insisted, and after a long day, he didn't want to argue. Therefore, when Paloma went to sleep in her room, she did not move from her place after the death of Senor Morgan, Daniel stripped down to a t-shirt and boxer shorts and lay down in his father's bed. At first, the memories and the strangeness of the bed kept him awake, but he must have been more comfortable than he thought because he fell asleep quickly. However, some time later, he was woken up by a sound in the hallway. As he sat up in bed, wondering if he had imagined it, he heard it again. Suddenly, he saw Paloma's dark figure open the door, tiptoe over to his bed and slide under the covers. He started to speak, but she put her soft hand over his mouth. Please, Daniel, it's been so long and I've been so lonely. Then she took her hand away and replaced it with her lips. In an instant, his objections were forgotten, and he returned her kiss with a passion that overwhelmed them both. His left arm slid around her, hugging her tightly to him, while his right reached for the straps of her nightgown to free her breasts. Her hands were just as busy sliding under the waistband of his underpants and trying to pull them down. He quickly sat down and pulled off his underwear, then helped her pull her nightgown over her head. He paused for a moment, appraising the slender athletic figure illuminated by the moonlight. But when he started caressing her, she interrupted him. No, I need you now, Daniel. Please don't keep me waiting any longer. When he heard that, he laid her back on the sheets and slid between her legs, spread in anticipation. He heard heavy breathing and realized that they were both at the peak of excitement. Moistening his male organ on her slippery female place, he carefully slid inside. Oh yes, oh yes, she moaned in his ear and began to rock her hips, urging him not to hold back. It's been too long for him too. Now his body took over, plunging him deep into her warmth, experiencing delicious sensations as he turned over and then repeated the process in an accelerating rhythm dictated by long-suppressed desire. As soon as he felt that he was approaching the climax, he heard her gasp, I feel it, Daniel. I feel it. Now, now, please, now. With that, they both exploded into a sexual crescendo, leaving them clinging to each other in exhaustion from pleasure. The following evening, a celebration of the Warhol installation in the Birch Grove took place. Grant Nicholson arrived early, leaving his wife to come separately. All the better for you to make a grand entrance, he told her. When he was looking through the checklist for the festivities, he was startled by a knock on his office door. Looking up, he saw the worried face of the curator of the museum. What? What is it? He asked impatiently. Sir, there's something wrong with the Warhol painting, the woman said anxiously. What? It's not damaged, is it? 
No, sir, nothing like that. It just doesn't look quite right. It looks wrong. What are you talking about? It's just that some colors don't look the way they should. It's an artist's proof, Nicholson exploded. It doesn't have to look perfect. The curator grimaced, but insisted on her own. And Warhol's signature, sir. It's not faded as it should have been. I mean, he would have signed it back in the 60s. The ink should have faded. Is that what's bothering you? How do you know what ink Warhol used? Come back and make sure everything is ready. The guests will arrive any minute. The little woman didn't budge. But that's not the point, sir. The problem is that it's the wrong size. What? Yes, sir. Marilyn Monroe Warhol's size is 90 by 90 centimeters. I look to make sure. The proof must be the same size. But this print has an area of only 89 square centimeters. Nicholson's mouth dropped open. So what exactly do you want to say? The curator looked like she was about to cry. Sir, this print is a fake. It cannot be authentic in any way. Oh my God, the museum director exclaimed, leaning back in his chair, trying to comprehend the horror of her revelation. Are you sure? What is it? He asked desperately. Yes, sir, I'm sorry. He stared silently into the distance, stunned by what was happening. Sir, sir, the supervisor interrupted him anxiously. What do you want us to do? Maybe we should go and hang it up after all. Are you crazy? Nicholson screamed, making the woman flinch. If people find out that we deliberately hung a fake work of art, it will mean the end of the birch grove. He flinched and then pointed at the curator. Put away the work and hide it. Tell your people to turn off the lights and put up a sign saying the event is canceled. When the woman hesitated, Nicholson shouted, Do it. Do it now before it's too late. The curator hurriedly left and Nicholson leaned back in his chair, thinking about the disaster that had befallen him. An idea occurred to him, and he rushed to his secretary's desk. Call the guard at the main entrance and tell him to chain the main gate. Quick, quick. She paused, startled. What should I tell him to tell the guests? Just say that the event has been canceled due to an emergency situation. Nothing more. Now hurry up. Oh, and no more phone calls, okay? The frightened young woman nodded, but before she could pick up the phone, the phone rang. Sir, she said, it's the curator again. Do you want to talk to her? What does she want now? He asked a rhetorical question while the secretary sat nervously waiting. Okay, I'll pick up the phone in my office. You call the exit on the other line and make sure no one else comes in, he ordered. Returning to his desk, Nicholson picked up the phone, and the supervisor began to mumble something. This is the caterer, sir, and he wants to know what to do with the food you ordered. Tell him to take it back, Nicholson exploded. Damn it, we definitely don't need this. I've already tried it, sir, but he says he can't. It's already spread out on the tables. He says he is now forbidden to take it back. Damn it, then tell him to take it to a homeless shelter. Champagne and caviar, sir? Just do it, he snapped and slammed down the phone. Leaning back in his chair, Nicholson put his head in his hands, trying to think of a way out of this situation. This can't be happening, he kept saying. Could you explain to me what in the name of all that's holy is going on? A familiar voice rang out. I had to walk all the way from the main gate to get up here. The shocked, exhausted director looked up at the purple face of his chairman of the board. Adrenaline surged into Grant's bloodstream as he desperately tried to think of some way to calm the angry man. Actually, Mr. Worthington, we managed to avoid a disaster. When we discovered the problems with Warhol, I knew you wouldn't want the celebration to go on. What do you mean by the Warhol problem? The executive director demanded an answer, leaning threateningly towards Nicholson. Sir, it looks like the fingerprint is fake. It's a fake, sir. Fake, Worthington yelled. How the hell could you accept a fake? You people are supposed to be experts in the field of art. Didn't it occur to you to inspect it before turning on the PR machine and bragging to the world about your coup? I know how it looks, sir. But there was a question about the will. And then we had to work with the security company to get it here. Sir, you should have seen what kind of security the old man had. Worthington thundered. In its current form, the Birch Grove will be a laughing stock in the art world for many years to come. And I think I speak for the board when I say that you are responsible for this debacle. Consider yourself fired as of tonight. As soon as you can drive through the terrible traffic jam that you have set up there, you need to leave this room and never come back. Before Nicholson could protest, Van Worthington turned and strode away, not even glancing at the cowering girl behind the counter outside. Oh my God, I'm broke, the former CEO groaned. When this gets out, 
No museum in the country will hire me. While he was sitting indulging in self-pity, his secretary suddenly appeared. Sir, there's a call for you, she said in a trembling voice. I told you, Nicholson growled. No more phone calls. I'm sorry, Mr. Nicholson, but this is your wife, and she asked me to tell you that if you don't talk to her, you don't have to come home tonight. Nicholson was beaten up. Okay, put her through, he agreed. When the connection was established, he had no doubt how angry Greta was. You better come up with a damn good explanation for this, Grant. I've been stuck here in traffic for God knows how long. People keep walking back and forth along the row of cars, and when they see me, they want to know what's going on. And I, the wife of the executive director, am as ignorant as they are. If you intended to humiliate me, you couldn't have chosen a better way to do it. She paused to catch her breath. So, what can you say in your defense? It's very simple, dear, Nicholson said calmly. When we hung the Warhol painting in the exhibition hall, we discovered that it was a fake. A fake? She exclaimed. Of course we couldn't put up a fake, so we had no choice but to cancel the show. It's a pity that we didn't disclose the problem until the last minute. He paused, swallowed, and then decided to accept his fate. It is also unfortunate that in such situations someone has to be the scapegoat, regardless of whether he is guilty or not. Despite everything I've done for Birch Grove, Van Worthington has just relieved me of my duties. This took effect immediately. She gasped. Did Worthington fire your ass? Oh my God, this is really amazing. She took a deep breath. Look, Grant, I've put up with a lot from you over the years, not the least of which was your sordid affair with that little slut you hired as a development director. I've looked the other way too many times, but this has gone too far. Don't come home tonight or ever, except for your personal belongings. My lawyer will file for divorce first thing in the morning. Do you understand? He sighed with the sigh of a defeated man. Do you understand? She repeated. Yes, dear. When he heard that the call had been interrupted, he lowered his head to the table, completely defeated. Paloma heard about the disastrous opening at Birch Grove and the dismissal of Grant Nicholson from Christina. When she hurried to tell Daniel, he took the news with satisfaction, but not with surprise. I told you I'd get back at him for what he did to my marriage, he said. She looked at him questioningly. But how could you know that this would happen? I'm not, well, not really. But I set it up so that most likely he would have committed suicide. He grinned. I could not have known that he would do it in such a public and humiliating way. But I was sure of the outcome no matter what. And after what he and Susan tried to do, I think he got exactly what he deserved. Paloma looked at him carefully now. So what exactly did you do, Senor Daniel? I still don't understand. He smiled. Come with me to my office at the university. That way I can show you. When they reached his cluttered office, he pulled out a chair for her before sitting down himself. Let's talk about Susan first, he said. As you know, her plan was to keep her affair with Nicholson a secret until Parkinson's disease killed my father. Her father's condition was deteriorating rapidly, so she was pretty sure she wouldn't have to wait too long. She couldn't apply before her father died because she needed me to inherit his estate. That way, she would get half of everything. His house was valuable, but the real prize, of course, was his war hall. I do not know what legal maneuver she planned to take, but her lawyer was confident that he could ensure that war hall was considered public property. After the settlement, she would have walked away with half the auction value, a lot of money. But you and your cousin found out about her affair, and when I found out what she and Grant were up to, I went to talk to Dad. I knew that his intention was to leave war hall to me, but after I heard about Susan's plans, I convinced him to hand over the job to Birch Grove. Not only would it be safe for her, but we could use the will as leverage on her. He smiled. And it worked. When Grant found out that the only way Birch Grove could get Warhol was to sever all ties with my wife, he dumped Susan like a hot potato. Daniel became thoughtful. I do not know if Grant was really in love with Susan, but I am almost sure that she was just using him as another step up the social ladder. However, she quickly realized how deep his affection for her was. As soon as my father's will was read out, she lost her job, her lover, and of course, her marriage to me. Everything turned out exactly as I had hoped. By the way, a friend told me the other day that Susan had moved to Allentown. He had heard that the only job she could find was working at a telemarketing center selling insurance policies. Instead of moving up the corporate ladder, my ex-wife has dropped significantly. This is probably the most painful punishment I could wish for her. 
I understand how you got back at Susan, Paloma nodded, and I think she got exactly what she deserved. Cheating on your husband is bad in itself, but plotting to take advantage of you and your father is terrible, she said, using the Spanish pronunciation. But what about Nicholson? What did you do to him? He grinned. You know about what happened in the Birch Grove last night, right? Well, some of it. Mostly I was just shocked to find out that your father's painting wasn't real. There was sadness in her eyes. In a way, I'm glad Senor Morgan didn't have to hear this cruel news. Daniel looked at her appraisingly. It says a lot that your first reaction is to think about my father. He got up from his seat, but don't worry too much about him. Reaching behind a filing cabinet, he pulled out the Marilyn Monroe textbook he had used in his introductory course and placed it on the table. She looked at him uncertainly. A great writer once said that the best way to keep something safe is to hide it in plain sight. Let me show you something. He turned the painting over so she could see the back, wrapped in brown paper. He carefully peeled back the paper, revealing the inscription, To Ezra Morgan for all his hard work, Andy Warhol. Is this a real painting? Paloma gasped. But this is the one you use in your classes. You told me about it. She's just standing here in your office. Daniel smiled and nodded. But when did you make the exchange? Another engraving hung in your father's living room long before Marco and I moved here. If anything, it was long before you knew what Susan was planning. And with all the guards that Senor Morgan had, how could you replace her? Daniel grinned. At first, Dad never thought that his engraving was so expensive. After all, Warhol originally sold his screen prints for only a few hundred dollars each. But as the popularity of his work grew, Dad began to worry about having authentic works of the artist at home. We discussed this with him, and I offered to exchange the real painting for a cheap engraving. I would leave the real Warhol here and use him in my lectures so that no one would suspect that there is any value in him. He would have hung a reproduction on the wall in his living room. Later, when Warhol's value continued to grow, Dad came up with the idea to install a security system to protect him. He believed that no one would question the authenticity of the work protected by all these security measures. It became a game for him. He was always looking for new high-tech protection devices. Daniel smiled at Paloma. Fortunately, there were never any hacking attempts, but I'm sure that all this security system helped convince Nicholson that he was buying the real thing. So, you changed the prints before I went to work for your father. That's right. I intended to swap them when Dad eventually died. But after I found out about Grant and Susan, I saw a way to get back at them both. After I talked to Dad that night, he asked his lawyer to rewrite the will so that Nicholson would definitely leave Susan. Then I let Grant pick up the fake war hall, believing that he would want to showcase his prize as quickly and as publicly as possible. Of course, he took the bait, and just like Susan... He lost his job, his marriage, and his reputation. So, what's going on now? My plan is to let all the commotion at the Birch Grove die down. As soon as this happens, I will quietly inform the board of directors that I found the real Warhol in a storage container that I did not know existed. After they have the opportunity to verify its authenticity, I will ask that a plaque be hung on it, perpetuating my father's connection with Warhol. Aren't you sorry that you don't have a Warhol for yourself? After all, it was very valuable. He smiled at her. To be honest, I don't feel bad at all. I never wanted to take on the responsibility of owning an important piece of art. And as for money, it was Susan who craved wealth and status, not me. After what I've seen that longing do to her, I'm just as glad I can get away with it. Then his smile grew even wider. Besides, I hope that all this will help me achieve a more important goal. She looked at him uncertainly. What is the goal? To become part of a new family. What did you just say? What's the new family? Daniel came around the table to take her hands. The new family is with you, Marco and me. When a graduate student who came to visit Professor Morgan saw the couple in each other's arms, she smiled and tiptoed away. After walking far enough down the hall, she called a fellow student. Do you remember how we were so worried about Professor Morgan after he lost his father and wife? Well, I think our beloved professor will be fine.